the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the
So they say when the shovel first came out, they called it groundbreaking technology, the shovel. So there are many guys in the Bible, Goliath, and I said, wow, he's really tall. How tall is he? Nine feet tall. And I said, I'm seven feet tall. I said, well, who is the shortest person in the Bible? And I had read through the Bible and come to find out his last name was Maya, but his first name was Nehi. Nehi Maya. Can you believe that? Nehi Maya. So the Lord said to Josiah, come forth and receive eternal life. But unfortunately, Josiah came in fifth and won a toaster. to the Detroit Church of Christ. So glad you're here tonight, and I hope you're having a great week so far. You know, but hey, even if you're not, you're in the right place. Tonight, we are going to listen to Greg Johnson teach us about hope during hardship. It's gonna be a great message. I'm excited to hear it with you. So 
Before we get into this, we'll have another worship song, but let's say a prayer. God, thank you so much for all that you do for us. God, thank you for giving us people who can teach us your word uh, in a powerful way uh, to teach us new things, even about how we can find hope through difficult times. God, thank you for bringing this group of people together that we can worship you tonight and that we can be a part of what you're doing here in Detroit. We love you, God, and Jesus' hand pray. Amen. Enjoy the worship. Join us in singing, sing amen. One, two. Sing amen, amen, rejoice, amen. Glory be to God, amen, amen. Sing amen, amen, rejoice, amen. Glory be to God, amen, amen. When the Lord shall come again. Let the people sing to God, amen, amen. When the Lord shall come again, let the people sing to God, amen, amen. Sing, amen, rejoice, amen. Glory be to God, amen, amen. Sing, amen, rejoice, amen. This is Greg Johnson, and this is Lesson 1 of Hope During Hardship. In this lesson, we'll explore the question, is hardship necessary? So it's obvious that no one likes hardship or pain. Yet some of us choose to use a personal trainer or a life coach to help us improve. Often, there is hardship or pain in the process that the trainer uses. For example, the personal trainer may use resistance training as a tool for growth. Is this true for spiritual growth as well? Can resistance or difficulties in our lives help us to grow spiritually? In the book of Hebrews, like many New Testament writings, we have a window into the lives of early Christians. The book of Hebrews is an exceptional letter to a group of Christians who are facing hardship and discipline and may even have been struggling in their faith. Maybe some of us can relate. The writer of Hebrews looks at difficulty in the lives of believers from a different perspective. We might say that the Hebrew writer is wearing spiritual glasses. The writer seems to be making the case that difficulty in life may actually be an opportunity for spiritual growth. It seems difficulty or hardship can actually expose areas of our hearts that we are not even aware of. Sinful attitudes, incorrect thinking, selfishness, or even distance from God can be exposed. Sometimes we bring this hardship on ourselves, and at other times we experience difficulties without any apparent cause or reason. Either way, the pain is the same and it is real. How does the godly person deal with difficulties and still remain faithful? How do we deal with these difficulties and still honor God and be a blessing to others? 
These are some of the serious questions that Scripture can help us answer. Hebrews 12.7 calls us to endure hardship as discipline. It says God is treating you as his children. God is treating us as his children. So God calls all of us to endure all of our hardships as discipline. Not just some of our hardships, all of our hardships as discipline. God is asking us to grow from any and every hardship that we might experience. We are to view that hardship as an opportunity to grow. In a sense, we can see the hardship as resistance training. The hardship may not be our fault, but we can learn from it. We might even ask ourselves how we can become a more godly person while going through the hardship. I've even heard of people say that they don't want to waste the pain. Can we impact other people in spite of the pain or even because of the pain? Continuing in verse 11, it says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So how can we go through hardship and have the outcome be positive? The Hebrew writer advises us in verse 14 and 15 to make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. This is some powerful advice and deserves a little exploration. Let's look at the first idea. Make every effort to live in peace with all men. Let's leave Hebrews for a minute and see what Peter has to say about this. The Apostle Peter knew a little bit about this topic. His missionary work in northern Turkey brought him to a persecuted people who were enduring much hardship. Peter says succinctly in 1 Peter 4.19, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This is hard to understand emotionally. Sometimes it's God's will for us to go through hardship. Does that mean that God doesn't love us? No, it's just the opposite. God loves us and doesn't want us to remain in our current state. God is allowing this resistance training that we call difficulty to build our spiritual muscle and refine our character. Peter explains in 1 Peter 6, 7, Now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter uses this image of gold being heated up so that impurities can be removed. As the gold is melted, the impurities rise to the surface and can be scraped off. This is not a new metaphor in the Bible. In Malachi 3.3, it reads, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. In a sense, we are the Levites. We are the royal priesthood, and we are set apart to be a light to this world. We might reread this scripture or this passage this way. God will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. God will purify Detroit and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men and women who will bring offerings in righteousness. This scripture describes how during the heat of painful suffering, our impurities can come to the surface and be removed. God is able to remove our impurities as long as we trust him and continue to do good. We may not even be aware of our impurities. Sometimes they are obvious, like lust or greed, 
but at other times, they may be more subtle, like impatience or pride. Regardless, God is calling us to trust him while we go through this refining process. And at the same time, God is calling us to do good to others. From my own experience, I know that pain can spur my own character growth. I don't like it, but it seems necessary at times. When we experience physical or emotional trauma, we are left with a choice. We can choose to be angry with God and others, or we can choose to trust God. Do we believe Romans 8.28 that says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Do we believe that God has our best interests at heart? Do we believe that God loves us and wants the best for us, even if we don't understand our present circumstances? Will we trust God? Jesus trusted God, and it resulted in the cross. But it also resulted in the salvation of many. Joseph trusted God, and it resulted in betrayal, slavery, and even unjust imprisonment. But it also resulted in the saving of many lives. Paul trusted God, and it resulted in persecution, floggings, stonings, and imprisonment. But it also resulted in a deep understanding of God's plan and the preaching of that plan to the Gentiles. In Hebrews 13, 5, the writer reminds us that God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Similarly, Paul tells us in Romans 8 that if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God loves us. He will take care of us. We can trust him. Continuing in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves us. He will take care of us. We can trust him. Again, God is for us. He will give us victory. Our part is to work with the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews 12, 14, we are called to live in peace with everyone. In 1 Peter 4, 19, we are called to do good. Now in Luke 6, 36, we are called to be merciful. Jesus says in Luke 6, 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Often we think of mercy as helping out the needy. However, I don't think that is what Jesus was getting at in this context. In this context, Jesus is teaching the crowd some radical ideas, such as loving their enemies and being kind to the ungrateful and wicked. When Jesus mentions being merciful, he starts by talking about judging others. It appears that mercy is more than just helping out the needy. Let me explain by giving an example. Have you ever been driving in the car and cut someone off or pulled out in front of someone? Have you experienced that person then reacting in anger, such as making an obscene gesture or even something worse? How did that make you feel? Did you know that you did something wrong even before the other driver reacted? Did you need that other driver's condemnation to help you understand? Did their condemnation help you to drive better? Probably not. A critical or violent response is not mercy. I'm not saying that we don't teach. If you're a teen and in driver's ed, you expect the instructor to guide you. But if the instructor is rude or screams and yells, it may be counterproductive. 
especially if done publicly. This is true with social media as well, especially when we don't, when we don't see the person's face or understand where they are coming from. Mercy may be talking to someone privately about a perceived insult or infraction. Mercy may start with us asking the other person to explain, from their perspective, what happened. We might start by trying to understand them a little more. For example, we might say, you said this the other day. I'm trying to understand. Can you explain to me a little more? James 1.19 says that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So we all want to please God. But are all of God's commands of equal importance? Does God desire some things more than others? If you had to make a choice between fasting and showing mercy to someone, which do you think would please God more? Hosea the prophet tells us that God desires mercy, not sacrifice. Our sacrifice of food when we fast is not as important as showing mercy to others. Denying ourselves is important, but God asks us to start by showing mercy to others. Then we can fast or offer other sacrifices to God. The idea of mercy is pretty deep and goes beyond what we have touched on here. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 13, uh, 9, chapter 9, verse 13, tells the Pharisees to figure out what this statement from Hosea actually means. It might be good for us to explore mercy as well. In closing, during difficulties, we can have victory by trusting God and then showing our trust by living in peace with all people, doing good, and showing mercy to people. For now, here are a few questions that you might consider yourselves or maybe even discuss in your small group. These questions can be found at the URL at the bottom of this, uh, of this page, the bottom of your screen, uh, tinyurl.com slash hope during hardship. If you click on that link or type that into your web browser, that'll take you right to these questions. But I'll go ahead and read over these questions uh, just to make it easier for you. Uh, question number one, is hardship sometimes necessary? In these questions, I've gone ahead and put in a couple um, uh, scripture references that you might utilize. Um, uh, for example, this one here in Acts 8, uh, 1 through 14, it, it describes how the gospel had not really been preached outside of Jerusalem uh, until the persecution. There was a major persecution. The persecution actually furthered the spread of the gospel, even to the Samaritans, who many of the Jews considered unclean. And what? And the, in fact, you, you, you all know that the Jews didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritans. Well, what about you? Can you give an example from your own life that shows how hardship can have a positive result? Question number two, would you endure hardship if it helped your kids trust Jesus? What about your family? What about the world? Question three, how can you live in peace with all people even when they don't deserve it? Question number four, how can you continue to do good in spite of your suffering? Question number five, how can you show mercy? How can you show mercy in person? How can you show mercy on social media? Question number six, what are some other aspects of mercy? What might mercy look like in your own life? In closing, may the peace of God guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Ain't no rock, ain't no rock, gonna stand in my place. As long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. Ain't no rock, ain't no rock, gonna stand in my place. As long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. Ain't no rock, ain't no rock, gonna
as long as I'm allowed to glorify His holy name. You've got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. You've got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. Ain't no tree, ain't no tree gonna lift its branches. I lift my hands to glorify His holy name. Ain't no tree, ain't no tree gonna lift its branches. I lift my hands to glorify His holy name. You got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. You got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. Ain't no bird. Sing in my place, I lift my voice to glorify His holy name. Ain't no bird, ain't no bird gonna sing in my place. I lift my voice to glorify His holy name. You got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. You got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. Ain't no rock, no tree, no bird gonna stand in my place as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. Ain't no rock, no tree, no bird gonna stand in my place as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. You got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. You got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. You got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. You've got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. You've got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. You've got to praise His holy name as long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. As long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. As long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name. Thank you so much, Greg, for that great message. And I hope that you all enjoyed it as well. Uh, something that really stuck out to me is that no matter what we go through, all, all the difficulties and trials, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And, and I'm super grateful for that. Uh, very thought-provoking, and I hope that you get a great opportunity to discuss the questions uh, with your with your house church or small groups. If you don't have a small group or a house church that you're a part of, uh, or you'd like to get tied into one, please reach out in the comments or reach out on our website, and we can get you tied in with a, a small group to be able to, to discuss these questions uh, either this evening or later on throughout the week. I hope that you have a great rest of your evening. I'm going to close this out with a prayer. God, thank you so much for giving us a group of people that we can go through these hardships with together and that we can help mourn with each other and lift each other up, God. I pray that we can never forget that you'll be with us through all that we go through, God, and that you are there to comfort us and give us peace. Uh, we love you, God, and just pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a great night.